people are worried that AGI is, you know, maybe next week or just around the corner or in, like they used to say in a few years. And now that we have these very good language models, they say maybe like small number of years, months, like possibly weeks and hence the proposed moratorium. So what is the thing that makes you so chill? Like why? Why couldn't it lead to AGI? What's what's the problem with with the idea of of emergence? Because you know, intelligence emerged once. Yes. So emergence isn't magic. It is, of course, possible that in the deep ocean, a new form of life is emerging at this very moment, and it will break the surface weeks from now. Or on Pluto. Did you hear about Pluto? They discovered that that there's ice or something and that they've sent another probe, but it's going to take eight years for it to come back and find out whether there's life on Pluto. I hadn't heard that, but there certainly is a possibility of life in various places in the solar system, but not, I think, not intelligent life. But if you're going to say emergence can do unexpected things, then you might as well say it about the deep ocean because we know less about that than we do about Pluto. So, and there there are theories that our form of life began in the deep ocean. So who knows? Now, I, I think in my view, AGI has as little to do with AI as it has with the deep ocean. Both of them, you can say, well, it, it's, it's unexpected. An unexpected thing could happen. They, the AI could lead to AGI. The deep ocean could lead to AGI. But I don't think there's any more to be said about this than that. In fact, less, because uh, the deep ocean already produced life once, or more, maybe more than once. But AI is the opposite of AGI. So I think the the most immediate way that I have found to illustrate why I think AI and AGI are opposites is that for an AGI, there is such a thing as a criterion for how well it's meeting its specification. Before we jump into that, what makes people think that AI is just a less advanced AGI? Uh, It's because they have the wrong epistemology. Basically, the prevailing epistemology is not Popperian. It is in many ways anti-Popperian. And it's some form of empiricism, inductivism, and the most recent popular form of inductivism is so-called Bayesianism, although I prefer to call it Bayesian epistemology, because a different thing is also called Bayesianism, which is a a certain way of treating statistical tests and that kind of thing using Bayes' Bayes theorem. But Bayesian epistemology has a much wider application than that, and also has become a popular philosophy of knowledge in its own right that doesn't really have much to do with statistical analysis. People make an argument that you should take a Bayesian view about X, Y, and Z when they don't mean uh, look at tables of statistics and apply a certain formula. They mean adopt a certain philosophy. Uh, What is their view about how AI becomes AGI? Like, why do they think those are that's a spectrum rather than a binary? Because what the most advanced AIs do is that they do this thing that, that inductivism or Bayesianism would have them do, namely take a vast amount of data and process it in a way that can give rise to predictive theories. So some people say, you know, uh, the the modern chatbots are are just predictive test, predictive text engines, and that's a bit unfair. But but at, at the level of epistemology, that's what they think is happening, and they don't realize that there is anything else. So why is the prevailing view 
that AGI is an advanced form of AI. And I was saying because under the prevailing epistemology, there is no other way of generating knowledge or new theories or new predictions other than generalizing from data. And it so happens that the latest AI technology, chatbot technology, and also chess playing, you know, all the advanced forms of AI do in fact operate by taking a vast amount of data and distilling from it essentially a predictive theory. Wait, so does it work by induction? No, it doesn't work by induction in the sense that induction is a theory about how knowledge is created. They, they don't create knowledge. But they do. I can ask you something and it can, it can generate stuff. Yeah, well, you can look things up in a dictionary. Yeah, but it and, generates stuff that doesn't exist on a dictionary. So does your calculator. So mm -hmm. your, your calculator produces output that's never been produced on Earth before. Um, and you can call that creating knowledge if you like, but it's not knowledge in the sense that we want when we say that we want scientific knowledge or we want human type knowledge. What is the difference? Well, the, the difference, so the, the difference between a calculator and uh, the difference between a calculator and an AI and the difference between an AI and, a, and an AGI or a human, those are two distinct differences. One is that a calculator is essentially an automated lookup table. It, it, uh, it consists of an algorithm that was programmed in by somebody who knew what the transformation between the inputs and outputs ought to be. Namely, when you press a certain button, it multiplies and so on. Um, AIs, modern AIs, essentially construct their algorithm themselves from, uh, a, a, by generalizing a large amount of data. This, this uh, in, in, in early ones, this led to kind of embarrassing glitches, like when they, when they identified, uh, you know, a heap of um, rifles as a cat because somebody worked out what they were doing and how to fool them. But the modern ones use so much data and have been honed by humans so well that they rarely do this. Although I've recently been playing around with the chat GPTs and I find that if you ask it some questions off the beaten track, you can quite easily cause it to do all the old things of either saying nonsense, contradicting itself, um, committing howlers where it says the opposite of, of known facts and, and so on. And that, that's different from human knowledge, which is explanatory. Neither of the, neither the calculator nor the chatbot ever produces a new explanation. Well, you can ask it for an explanation, but all it's doing is distilling explanations that already exist. And that's the thing that it doesn't do very well either. What is the difference between an explanation and the thing that it does produce? If we knew the detailed answer to that, we'd know how to make an AGI. But basically, an explanation accounts for what it's trying to account for, like a physical process or the reason for something. It, it accounts for that. It accounts for a known thing that it's trying to explain in terms of the unseen, unknown reasons behind it, which usually cannot even be seen, even in principle. Um, so uh, Brett Hall's favorite example is that we, we can never see the center of the sun. Um, we could never go there. Uh, any instrument that we send would get destroyed long before it got to the center of the sun. So the center of the sun can't be in GPT's training data? As it were, yes. Exactly. And the only thing that can be in GPT's training data is what is seen about the sun, namely its surface. Couldn't GPT derive things about the sun based on other th theories that we have? Uh, it, it can deduce th things from existing theories, yes. So if you ask it about the centre of the sun, it will 
find some existing theory of the sun and make a deduction from that. So that's not induction, that's deduction. And um, on the other hand, if there was a mystery about the sun, like a couple of decades ago... Isn't it induction via deduction? So the induction was all of the training data, and then the deduction is taking that data and then forming theories about it. Uh, no, because it didn't induce the data. It, it distilled it in, into a, a more compact form. And then it can deduce things from that. But those things are only ever as good as the original theories were, probably slightly worse because by compressing the data, it slightly degraded it. Or in some cases, it degraded it a lot. Um, a few decades ago, I was, I was going to say recently, but in fact, not so recent. It was when I was a graduate student. The big problem in astrophysics was that the sun wasn't producing enough neutrinos. Enough for what? Enough for your breakfast cereal. <laughs> uh, it wasn't producing as many as the theory predicted. And this theory was extremely robust because it was also the theory that we used to predict the sun's brightness. And it predicted the sun's brightness extremely well, and also the brightness of other stars and how they change with time and all that stuff. So when they, made, when they first made neutrino observatories with rather crude neutrino detectors, first they, f they didn't find neutrinos, but then they found a few, but nowhere near enough. And when they refined it, they found that there were, there were only a third as many neutrinos as, as predicted by the theory. And so there were all sorts of explanatory theories proposed, which couldn't possibly have been induced from anything, because all the data said was there are too few neutrinos. And of course, you can always say that the neutrinos have been eaten by a space monster. But generally, when we produce scientific theories, we don't just want a new explanation. We want a new explanation that doesn't upset old explanations, uh, that, that um, doesn't make them into nonsense, like the space monster theory. So you asked me what the difference is between an explanation and just a predictive theory. And by the way, all th there is no such thing as a purely predictive theory. They all have some kind of explanation and when you're quote inducing things from data you're always using an old explanation and just piling on some tweaks which don't have an explanation in order to make your supposed new theory so no one could have induced from the data or lack of data in this case um, what the explanation was um, because the explanation turned out to have nothing to do with stars, nothing to do with uh, measuring instruments, nothing to do with space, um, and somebody came up with it, and then it was tested and uh, passed the test, and now we know. Turns out that completely unbeknownst to anybody, there are three types of neutrinos and they convert from one to the other. So the sun only produces one of those kinds, but by the time the neutrinos get to us, they've converted like to, you know, the sun produces neutrino type one, and then when it's moved a few million miles from the center of the sun, it's converted to neutrino two. And then after a while it's converted to neutrino three, and our detectors can only see neutrino one. I'm just imagining a whole line of breakfast cereals. Is there a breakfast cereal called Neutrino? Well, there's lots of, you know, spaghetti. -o. No, what is it? Oh, Neutrinos. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Um, the, the, the word Neutrino began as a joke. Um, oh, so it is a joke already. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, some one of the one of the mid 20th century physicists. I think it was Enrico Fermi. He was just making a joke about a thing that's like a neutrino but tiny. Uh, sorry, a thing that's like a neutron but tiny. So he called it a neutrino. Like nano. 
I think "ino" as a suffix has a meaning in Italian. Uh-huh. I, I think. Um, so anyway, um, so somebody thought of the explanation, and it couldn't have been induced. And that's uh, that's Brett Hall's favorite example. He may have got it from my favorite example, which is not as good, which is that nobody could have been present at the Big Bang, yet we form theories of the Big Bang, and we do not induce them from stuff we see around us, which is nothing like the Big Bang. So AIs can't create explanations, which means they can't create anything that isn't already in their data set in some way. In some way, yes. Um, They can move around parameters. So they can, you know, if you said, imagine some new theory about the sun, it, it might, I think it would be able to say things like, well, maybe the sun is twice as big as we think it is. And then if you ask it why, it might be able to see, it might say, well, because space is acting as a lens or, you know, it it might say things which are already explanations of something and which it's drawn into that area. Uh, Now, people will say, well, that's how humans make new explanations. Well, that's how humans (laughs) make explanations. Make new explanations. Make new explanations. Yeah. Yeah, everything is just, you know, making connections between existing stuff. Yeah. Well, in a There's sense... There's nothing that, new under the sun, David. In the sense, that must be true. But that is is the same kind of, uh, you know, bad explanation of explanations that uh, as it would be if you said, well, all the explanations are phrased in terms of 26 characters. And all the making a new explanation is rearranging those characters in a new way. So why is it not that? The letters of the alphabet. Well, well, because it, the, it makes a difference whether we make it into a new explanation or not. And most rearrangements of characters are not new explanations. Ah, so you're saying there's an infinite number of connections you could draw between things and only the ones that like actually work actually work. Yes, I mean, it's not actually infinite, it's exponentially large, but that, for practical purposes, that's the same thing. 